I wanted to mention something before we bring on our next guest. Uh, you know, I'm sending out some positive vibes tonight to former Nevada Senator Harry Reid. Now, I realize we live in an era when it's not permissible to admit we even know someone who might be from a political party different from our own, let alone send good wishes to a longtime elected official from that party. But in the context of coast-to-coast subjects, Harry Reid is a senator who initiated that Pentagon study of UFOs that we've been talking about, the one known as ATIP, but which actually was conducted under a different name. That study cast a very wide net looking for UFO information, evidence, files, information from our government, from other governments, from private sources, uh, did some studies of boots on the ground kind of studies at, at hot spots like the Skinwalker Ranch. Uh, the study created this huge database. Hopefully, we'll be able to um, access that database one of these days. And the study would have continued if it had not been for uh, cuts made by officials in the Pentagon who worried that the, once the news got out, it might be an embarrassment or others who thought that UFOs were demonic, uh, so they got rid of it. Anyway, uh, back on May 2nd uh, of this year, I was on my way to meet Senator Reid at his home here in, uh, in Southern Nevada in Henderson. But he called me while I was driving his way to say that the meeting was canceled because he'd undergone this routine medical screening and doctors had, in his words, found something. Well, that something turned out to be pancreatic cancer. He underwent surgery two weeks later at Johns Hopkins in uh, Baltimore, one of the premier medical centers for that particular problem. And uh, I don't know if you know about pancreatic cancer, but the chances of survival from that are about 5%. About 5% of the people who get it make it past six months. Whether you agree with Senator Reid's politics or not, uh, I think he showed courage in launching that UFO study, and he'd probably do it again if he could. He is, at the moment, back in Nevada. I spoke to him on Friday. He's recuperating at home, and uh, I'm sending him good vibes and and, uh, good wishes and hope he gets better. And if anyone can pull through, he's a pretty tough guy. We switch gears now. The, The paranormal, psychic phenomena, you know, We often talk about it on this program. It'd be great if scientists would give these subjects a fair shake, if they'd look at it, study the data, speak to the people who know about it. For a while, that was true with some of these uh, phenomena. In the 80s, psychic studies at uh, universities and within some government programs, unclassified things like remote viewing, were underway. Uh, Those are pretty much gone now. But there are some academics with the courage to study them, including mediums, the idea of spirits, consciousness itself. Uh, One of those is Dr. Jack Hunter, who's written a new book called Engaging the Anomalous, collected essays on anthropology, the paranormal, mediumship, and extraordinary experience. And when we come back, we're going to jump right into it with him. Welcome back. Dr. Jack Hunter is an anthropologist exploring the borderlands of consciousness, religion, ecology, and the paranormal. He lives in the hills of mid-Wales with his family. His doctoral research with the University of Bristol Examine the experiences of spirit mediums and their influence on the development of self-concepts and models of consciousness and in an effort toward non-reductive anthropology of the paranormal. He's a fellow of the Royal Anthropological Institute, sits on the RAE Education Committee. He served as a reviewer for the Journal of Exceptional Experiences and Psychology, the Journal of the British Association for the Study of Religion, Journal of the Study of Religious Experiences, and a bunch more. And he's written a new book called Engaging the Anomalous. Uh, Dr. Hunter, thanks for being here. It's great to have you. Uh, Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. I I thought uh, to myself, anthropology, you know, the the study of the paranormal, we've got physicists and we've got biologists, uh, but anthropology seems like a perfect platform uh, to jump into these topics, and I'm surprised there hasn't been more of it. Yeah, well, actually... Uh, that that's something that I thought when I first started to do my research in this area. But when I started to delve into it, I found that anthropologists have been interested in uh, researching paranormal topics going right back to the very beginnings of the discipline in the 19th century. So actually, anthropologists have been involved in the paranormal for a long time. It's just it's taken a long time as well for that to kind of trickle into kind of mainstream consciousness. So yeah, there's a whole load of um, really useful research, lots of useful uh, literature, books, and um, you know, scholarly papers that deal with the paranormal that are just waiting for the kind of the wider paranormal community to engage with them. So yeah, that's part of what I've been trying to do, is um, encourage a kind of an awareness of the fact that anthropology has got something to say about the paranormal. 
Um, in the foreword to your book by George Hansen, he makes the point that the in the 1980s, it was, it was kind of the high point for parapsychology in the U.S. They had six labs employed full-time researchers. Uh, uh, by now, though, there's only two of the labs that are still dedicated to parapsychology. However, in the U.K., it seems to be more politically acceptable in academic circles to study this. Is that true? Uh, it seems to be, yeah. We have, we've got quite a few different groups in the U.K., um, there are a few university-based groups. So there are parapsychology researchers at the University of Northampton. Um, there's some at um, Edinburgh University, obviously, with the Kursler Parapsychology Unit. And then there's also quite a few, you know, kind of like not university groups, but independent research groups. There's the Society for Psychical Research and um, ASAP, which is the uh, Association for the Scientific Study of Anomalous Phenomena. And then there are other groups like um, Exploring the Extraordinary, um, all of these networks that basically make it possible for people who are interested in these topics to kind of come together and talk um, in a kind of, you know, an accepting, um, open-minded way. I guess here in the U.S., uh, so much uh, research funding comes from the government, and it comes with strings attached. So topics like UFOs or uh, parapsychology or anything with the, any kind of perceived baggage doesn't get funding, so that's why it doesn't happen. The same is not true there, apparently. Is there is there government funding involved for the universities? Well, actually, you know, in terms of funding, it's quite it's still quite difficult to get hold of funding for uh, parapsychology and for paranormal topics. But we somehow seem to make it manage. Um, but yeah, it's not it's not usually government funding. It's usually um, funding from research organizations and arts councils and things like that. So uh, but yeah, there, there is money there. It's just very difficult to get hold of. You start writing about this. I'm not sure if it was always a part of your doctoral thesis, but it really got serious when you uh, pursued your Ph.D. Share with me the story of that conversation when you have your tell your academic advisor what your focus is going to be. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was, I was actually really lucky with my, <clears throat> with my supervisor because um, basically what happened, I, it was as I was writing my undergraduate dissertation, actually, which was also based with the same group of mediums that I worked with for my PhD. And um, I kind of went away and wrote the thesis, um, my dissertation up, and then I basically handed it to my supervisor, um, ready written. And she was really surprised. She didn't really know that I was interested in mediumship, and it turned out that she was interested in mediumship as well. And she had just been setting up this new group at Bristol called the Afterlife Research Centre. Um, and she said, you know, why don't you come and get involved in that? And it kind of all escalated from there, really. So I've had a few of these little kind of useful coincidences in my dealings with these things that have been really uh, really helpful for kind of getting my research off the ground. Oh, I was surprised there was an event, uh, a group called the Science, SSE, the Society for Scientific Exploration, which includes a lot of top-notch people, PhD folks uh, from all over the world, but they had their meeting here in Las Vegas earlier this month, and uh, and that while the focus of media reports, including mine, were on the UFO talks that were given and remote viewing talks that were given, they had a whole section um, and several speakers and panels about mediums. And I just didn't realize there was that much academic research uh, into the area of mediums and, you know, trying to figure out if the, that area was legit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's something that's really grown in popularity over the last, uh, I suppose, the last 10 years or so. There's a lot of good parapsychological research on mediumship. <clears throat> the Winbridge Research Institute, for example, they're trying to develop uh, ri rigid scientific experimental protocols to test um, claims of mediumship. So there's all of that interesting parapsychological research going on, and then there's the more kind of anthropological, um, sociological, and psychological approaches to mediumship, which are looking at um, sort of how mediumship influences health and well-being and the kind of the social and cultural um, influences on mediumship. So, yeah, there's a whole load of, uh, of research going on at the moment, and it's a really exciting time to be involved in um, academic paranormal research, I think. Well, you're a guy who, in effect, gets your hands dirty. It's boots on the ground. You jump right into it, and we're going to get into some of the experiences that you've had in, in interacting with mediums and even acting as a medium yourself. Um, but let's start with the framework for your approach to this. Uh, Para-anthropology, um, I'm, I'm mispronouncing that, but um, the idea that um, you go into the study of this without uh, being judgmental in that you're not trying to determine 
uh, is it legit necessarily? You're immersing yourself in it and and approaching the subject matter as if, what if it is real, as if it's real, and then uh, uh, proceed from there, right? Yeah, so that, that's my basic starting point. Um, instead of going into the field assuming that I already know what's going on, so assuming that, either assuming that the paranormal doesn't exist or assuming that it does exist, I like to go in with a kind of like a blank slate, um, open mind, and then experience um, experience what's happening firsthand and then build up my ideas after that. So I've been developing this idea called um, ontological flooding, which I write up about a little bit in this book. And uh, it's basically this idea that we have to be open to multiple different um, explanations and hypotheses simultaneously. So a good example would be in anthropology, for example, um, the, the dominant approach to studying spirit mediumship um, is kind of like a social functional approach, which means that they understand spirit mediumship as performing um, important functions within society. And one of those functions would be, for example, social protest in, in countries where, or in, in societies where um, the females are kind of like suppressed. Mediumship gives them an opportunity to um, to protest about that in a kind of a socially sanctioned way. So that's one good explanation that anthropology has. But my point is that that's only one of lots of different factors that are going on in mediumship. So it's not all just social protest. Um, there are you know, potential psi components involved in there. There's potential um, parapsychological and spirit you know, um, processes going on, as well as all of these other kind of more you know, mundane um, social processes and psychological processes and cognitive processes and even biological processes. So you know, given the fact that mediumship is so complex, you really do have to start off from this kind of blank slate perspective and just see where it leads you. And basically, that's what I've done. And this book is really, you know, it's a chronicle of my expanded thinking about mediumship over the last uh, seven years or so. Well, mediums have a pretty bad name. I mean, here, I mean, I would think on both sides of the pond, um, you know, you think of mediums and seances, you think of Victorian era era uh, rich ladies, uh having tea and, and little tiny sandwiches and having seances and being hoodwinked by, by some phony charlatan. I mean, that's what well, comes to mind for a lot of people when they think about this, right? Yeah, definitely, yeah. I mean, you know, in some ways it's also true because, you know, the, these seances that I go to, they are kind of like, they are quite quaint and they are quite ordinary on the surface of things. And they do have, you know, they do sit around and have sandwiches and eat biscuits and things at the end. Um, but there's also this other kind of experiential dimension. Um, so when, when you start to engage with it and experience it firsthand, you realize that those stereotypes that we've, you know, that we've all been kind of fed through the media, they're only giving us, again, a, just a small fraction of, of the truth of what's actually going on. So, yeah, as soon as you start to participate and as soon as you start to get over this kind of like, um, well, first of all, get over the aversion to mediumship that we seem to have, but also then get over this kind of like quaintness and things, then there seem to be really interesting things going on there. So yeah, definitely. It's, a, it's an interesting uh, subject area. So the big, the, the big picture, uh, dealing with spirits, um, you know, there are people who have trouble with spirits. They equate spirits with ghosts. On one hand, they might go to, go to church every Sunday or twice a week and, uh, and are, are praying and dealing with a religion that fundamentally believes in spirits that we're all spirits. Uh, but they might have trouble with ghosts or uh, um, ridicule the idea of ghost hunters or um, mediums who can communicate with the dead. Uh, when, in fact, you know, the, the, the idea that we are spirits, that we have a consciousness that may be um, spirit in nature, uh, spiritual in nature, that, that's pretty common all over the world and has been throughout human history, right? Yep, definitely. Yeah, there's a really interesting um, kind of tension between you know, mainstream religion and the paranormal. Because like you say, when we think about religion, we are really thinking about, like, the, the ultimate paranormal thing. It, it's basically saying, like you said, that we are all spirits and that there is a, you know, a, basically like a great spirit and, and all of these kinds of things. But there's still this tension. Um, religious people have seem to have an aversion to the paranormal. And one of the reasons that I think that is is because for me, um, as I understand it, the paranormal and religion are basically 
um, the same thing, as we've just pointed out. But what happens is, in religion, the paranormal is kind of um, domesticated. It's kind of made safe in a way, and it, it's kind of couched in, in doctrines and, um, and philosophy and stuff. And the paranormal itself is then the, the kind of like the wild or the untamed. Um, and people, you know, obviously people like to stay away from things that are wild and untamed. So even though the paranormal and religion, you know, on the surface of things and also at a deeper level as well are the same thing, there's still a tension because one is domesticated and one is, um, is, is wild. You mentioned in your book a couple of different places about uh, sort of the attitudes of uh, the Western world, the modern world, toward primitive, perceived primitive cultures and yeah. primitive cultures who believe in spirits and animism, I think is the term that you use, and, and uh, that there are spirits in all kinds of things, not just people. And and we look at it in sort of a condescending kind of a way. Well, they're primitive. They don't know how the world works. You know, you could make the argument that they actually are closer to how the world works than the rest of us, that that maybe those of us with smartphones and, and um, flat screen TVs have lost touch with something along the way. Yeah, definitely. I think that's, you know, a, a part of the, the problem that we're facing, like on, on a global scale in terms of our relationship with our, um, our environment, with our uh, ecosystems and with our planet. We seem to have lost touch with that. And one of the most interesting things that's coming out of my research at the moment is how all of this kind of paranormal uh, mediumship research and you know, research into how the paranormal is experienced and understood, how this relates to that wider ecological context. And like you say, when we think about things like animism, they seem to provide, um, you know, I, 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 I get wary about saying a better way, but they seem to Go provide ahead. an alternative, <laughs> you know, maybe better way of living in the world um, that we need to take heed of. You know, understanding the world as consisting of lots of different spirits with their own agency and intentionality, um, with their own kind of a, a world filled with other needs, basically, that we need to take heed of. Uh, and that's, that's what animism kind of teaches us, that we live in a world of relationships. So, yeah, I think there's a big connection there. Uh, and, and actually, I'm working on a, a new book project at the moment, um, kind of exploring those threads and connections. So that's pretty exciting stuff. Well, a lot more respect for the natural world, for plants and animals and environments and things of that sort, comes along with the territory. I think so, yeah. That's certainly what, what seems to be coming out in my research at the moment. In fact, and it also works the other way. Those people who um, seem to be engaging with the natural world, you know, going out and planting trees and working with natural processes, they also seem to end up having um, paranormal experiences as well. So, you know, it seems to work both ways. People who have paranormal experiences, alien abductions or whatever, often come back with a greater appreciation for their role in the environment and the ecosystem. And then those people who participate in the environment and ecosystem seem to come away with a more kind of supernaturalist or a paranormalist worldview in the end. So, yeah, it's really it's interesting and it's, it's surprising that no one's really been making these connections between anthropology and ecology. So I'm excited to see what comes out of this project, actually. I, uh, yeah, and, and, and when you finished your, I guess you write a thesis for your Ph.D., right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And how was that received at the university? Um, it was received very well, actually. Um, the thesis itself is, you know, it's very academic, and I've tried to keep it as, um, you know, as, uh, what's the word? Non-woo-woo. Non I mean, it's got a fair bit of woo-woo in there, but, you know, we've got to face up to that. But, um, yeah, I've tried to keep it as non-partisan as I can. So it's, a, you know, it's, it's as objective and um, academic and scientific as any other thesis. But I also try to weave in my own, um, my own experiences of being in the field. So, you know, it pushes, it pushes on, um, on boundaries, I think, within anthropology. Well, we're going to jump into your experiences because a couple of them are pretty dramatic, uh, and some of the other things that uh, have been reported by your colleagues are also dramatic. Uh, we're talking with uh, Dr. Jack Hunter about his book, Engaging the Anomalous, and in a moment we're going to get specifics on what he means by the anomalous and the kinds of things he encountered in his research. We're talking with Dr. Jack Hunter about his book, Engaging the Anomalous. You know, when you talk about the kind of subjects we discuss on this program— the concept of consciousness comes up 
a lot. I mean, there are those who suggest that it's related to just about everything you could quantify or qualify as paranormal, meaning UFOs and creatures and ghosts and uh, other kinds of uh, uh, remote viewing and psychic phenomena. And there are those who would suggest that consciousness is a function of the brain, that when the brain goes away, so does consciousness. Although, to be honest, we don't exactly know what consciousness is or what uh, generates it, where it comes from. In a moment, uh, Dr. Jack Hunter will talk to us about how consciousness relates to the investigation of psychic mediums uh, who uh, allegedly can communicate with the dead. We'll be right back. Dr. Jack Hunter, so you jump into this with both feet. You're going to look into psychic mediums, spiritual mediums, and you note early in your book that one of the most significant observations regarding the paranormal is that uh, lab investigations of psi phenomena ignore the emotional, social, and environmental context within uh, which the phenomena are reported. What do you mean by that, and why is it important? Yeah, I think that's a really important issue. And when we look at the um, laboratory experiments in parapsychology, the kinds of effects that we usually see are very, uh, very small effects, um, but nevertheless statistically significant effects. So it suggests that something is taking place. But the effects that we observe, so for example, um, you know, the classic um, experiment of, you know, influencing the, the fall of dice or influencing random number generators and things like that. Those effects are very small compared to the kinds of effects that people report in the real world. So when someone reports a paranormal experience <clears throat> from their everyday life, then usually it's something extravagant, um, you know, something high-powered, something really impressive, like, you know, a table, table's move or, I don't know, they see a ghost or, or, or a UFO or something. That just doesn't come across in, in the laboratory um, setting. So the, the question is, how can we study those kinds of much kind of um, much more powerful, much more high caliber uh, phenomena <clears throat> in a scientific manner? And there was an anthropologist um, writing in the 1960s called Ernesto Di Martino. He was an Italian anthropologist, and um, he basically pointed this out as well. And he, he was one of the first anthropologists actually to do work with in parapsychology, and a lot of his research funding came from the Parapsychology Foundation, which is pretty cool. And he basically said that what, what parapsychology needs to do is learn from anthropology uh, to understand the psi, the paranormal, um, the anomalous, whatever we want to call it, is embedded within um, our kind of social, emotional, uh, cultural systems. He's not trying to say that it's the product of our, our social structure or that it's just a cultural phenomenon, but he's saying that we can't ignore the fact that these, these aspects play a part. So it comes back to what I was saying before, that we, we're not going to get any kind of a, a simple explanation. In fact, the, the, ultimately, what we should be looking for is a really complex explanation that includes lots of different factors, right down to the biological and all of those kinds of the neurophysiological processes that are going on, all the way through to spirits and the possibility of psi and all of that and, you know, far out extreme um, hypotheses, and as well as the kind of social, emotional, uh, cultural factors that are involved. So, yeah, I think um, parapsychology could learn from anthropology in taking that kind of broader perspective and trying to incorporate, either trying to bring some of that um, complexity into the lab or take the lab out into that complexity. Well, an example, I mean, it's not uh, parapsychology, but an example that came to my mind as I was reading your book is that, you know, we hear these stories about uh, a mom, her, her baby is trapped under a car, and she suddenly, in the heat of that moment, uh, develops the strength to lift the car off the kid and save the life. You couldn't put mom in a lab and expect her to duplicate that because the context is not the same. Exactly, yeah. And that's, what, that's the point, is that it's these kinds of... Um extreme emotional uh, contexts that seem to give rise to the most powerful um, psi effects. So the question is, you know, how do, we, how do we approach that in a laboratory condition? Well, it's very difficult to. It's like trying to, um, you know, to get uh, lightning into the lab or something like that. Uh, these seem to be like natural phenomena that exist in bigger networks of different kinds of processes. So, so yeah, in, I think... Uh, so specific to spirits, for example, you uh, you use the 
the mental framework, the idea that uh, you take a position not that they exist or don't exist, you take the position that they could exist, and that's how you approach uh, situations and your studies. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a, it's kind of like an open-minded approach, really. Um, I don't want to assume anything, but I also want to be you know open and academically or intellectually um, brave enough to to be open to the possibility that there are other things that happen um, that, that exceed our kind of standard models in, in anthropology, but also, you know, more broadly in the sciences. I mean, if we don't go looking for spirits, for example, then we're not going to find them. <laughs> you see what I mean? Yes, I do. And do you think that it's uh, if you're closed-minded about the subject, you're never going to see uh, something paranormal? Uh, that's a good question. Not... Uh, it's, actually, I've talked about this a couple of times, because there seems to be something in paranormal that um, likes to kind of exceed our expectations. I and mean, there are loads of different accounts of people who were firmly, you know, firmly uh, against the paranormal, don't believe in it, but then they have an experience that convinces them. So, you know, we li- like what I'm trying to say is that culture plays a part. Our culture leads us to expect certain things. Um, and if you know if we believe, then perhaps we are more likely to experience. And if we don't believe, we're less likely to experience. But at the same time, there's always that room for um, unpredictability, uh, of you know spontaneity, where phenomena just happen, whether you believe in them or not. So we, we seem to be dealing with something that is you know influenced by our beliefs and expectations, but also has its own kind of independence as well. Let's talk about this uh, this particular location where you did a lot of your work. This group of of mediums and and you you learned a lot from them. You sat in, you immersed yourself in what they do. Uh, tell me about it. Yeah, um, well, it all started when I was doing my undergraduate dissertation, and I, I wanted to do some research on um, spirits because I was particularly interested in spirits and why it is that people come to believe in something that. I mean, this was my thinking at the time, early on. Why is it that people can come to believe in something that is so kind of like abstract, that isn't tangible in any way? And the best way to do that, I thought, was to try and find some people who regularly, um, you know, claim to interact with spirit. So the first thing I did was go to um, a spiritualist church in Bristol, which was uh, not far from where I was living at the time as a student. And I sat in on um, services there, and I... I had a few readings from mediums, and these were like, um, you know, like platform spiritualist mediums who um, they stand on the stage and they say, I'm getting a J coming through. Um, can anyone accept that? So it was that kind of mediumship. But because of the nature of the um, spiritualist church, and they have these um, constantly changing congregations, so they have people coming in because they're interested in mediumship, and then they might not come again, you know, ever again. Or you might have someone coming in because... Um, they, uh, a loved one has passed away and they want to make contact. But then, you know, after they've had their reading, they'll never turn up. So there was this fluctuating congregation. I didn't seem to be able to establish any kind of, uh, a, you know, a good dialogue with anyone, so I couldn't do my, the research that I wanted to do. And it was at that point that I decided maybe I need to find something that's a little bit more, you know, on a smaller scale, a little bit more personal. And I started to do a bit of research on the Internet, and I came across this group um, who were literally based about you know, 10, 15-minute walk down the road from where I was living uh, called the Bristol Spirit Lodge. And it was a small group said they were non-denominational. So although they would consider themselves to be spiritualists, they didn't affiliate themselves with um, the Spiritualist National Union, which is the kind of the governing body for spiritualists in the UK. Um, so they were independent of those big groups. They were smaller group with a kind of a, a regular set of sitters and mediums who would come to develop mediumship, um, you know, on more than once a week. Uh, and it seemed to be the perfect opportunity for me. So I, I basically sent an email. And then the next day, I went up to have a look and they were very, very welcoming. Um, and yeah, and basically, it's all come from there. <laughs> So you you go in to, to be an observer, and then it progresses to beyond that, though, right? Yeah. Well, the, the first time I went, I just went to kind of talk to the circle leader and interviewer. And then at the end of our session, she, she said, well, do you want to come to a, a seance? So I was like, yeah, sure, I'll come to a seance. So my very first seance, um, it was on a, a really kind of cold, 
January morning and there was ice and snow everywhere, the first thing that that um, showed me that you know there was more to medium ships than, than my expectations was the fact that the seance was taking place in the daytime. And, you know, based on my exposure to the media and all those kinds of things, I'd assumed that it would be in some kind of a Victorian manner in the middle of the night, but it wasn't. It was in suburban Bristol in the garden shed first thing in the morning. <laughs> and during the first seance, I saw a bunch of... Um, of strange, uh, strange kind of hallucinatory phenomena that I couldn't explain. One example was um, I saw the face of the medium seem to form and form like a kind of a green, almost like a mask over her face that kind of slowly slid down and, and dissolved as it appeared on her chest. And it, it resembled kind of like a, you know, a stereotypical kind of Chinese monk face. And I, I, I spotted them during the seance, um, but I kept it to myself because I was like, right, this is pretty weird. I don't want to go spouting out about this. And then when, at the end of the seance, like a couple of hours later, when we went back out into the house to have uh, um, the a bunch of other people, a couple of other people who had been in the seance said, oh, did you see that face? And I was like, oh, gosh, yes, I did see that face. So it was kind of like an independent validation of my own experience, which I assumed was a subjective experience, but in the end seemed to turn out to be an intersubjective experience. So from my very first uh, seance at the Bristol Spirit Lodge, I'd noticed strange phenomena that seemed to be you know, independently verified to a certain extent as well. So really, it brought my attention um, and uh, my further research and kind of moving more towards experiencing mediumship firsthand kind of stemmed from that. So the other phenomena that are happening, they're peripheral. Uh, they're not necessarily central to what the seance is trying to do. A medium yeah. is trying to communicate with a spirit. This stuff is going on around it, um, mm -hmm. almost for your entertainment or um, as a, a sidelight. Yeah, yeah, you could say that. Um, yeah, I mean, there are all of these the main purpose of the of the seance is to allow the, the spirits to communicate, and each medium has their own, they call them a spirit team, so they have a group of spirits, which could be anything from like two or three to like 15 spirits. Um, and then these, a lot of the spirits, sometimes they, they're, they're working towards specific phenomena, so some of the spirits in the spirit team might be responsible for creating spirit lights, for example, or one spirit might be responsible for trying to levitate objects like that so although the phenomena like the, the light, flashing lights and transfiguration and all of that are kind of peripheral at the same time you know you could argue or, or maybe they would make the case that they're actually it's kind of like the jobs of specific spirits in the spirit team to do that so it, it's all a part of it and i think you're you're right in touching on the entertainment aspect as well that um, entertainment plays a big part in these seances uh, they are entertaining spectacles, but I also think that, and I think also the spirits would agree, that that entertainment aspect is important in trying to bring about the right kind of, um, the right kind of mood, the right kind of um, atmosphere of expectation and, and those kinds of things to allow these more, these more kind of weird phenomena to manifest. Yeah, I'm, I'm, an outside observer could say the theatrics of a seance, it, it's kind of hokey. Uh, it's mm. designed to be a performance, you know, spooky music and close the blinds and make it dark. And But actually, as you write in this, it's sort of part of the ritual that makes it work. Yeah, I think so. So, like, um, using red light and, um, and blackout conditions, for example. I mean, obviously, as soon as you start to turn the light off, then, you know, you start to be suspicious that you're going to be tricked and things like that. But we also know from all sorts of different kinds of research in psychology, parapsychology, and anthropology that we can get into um, altered states of consciousness through sensory deprivation. So, you know, if, we start, if we're thinking about the importance and the role of consciousness in all of these kinds of things, then we're focusing on the importance of altered states of consciousness. We know that blackout conditions and red light conditions can lead to altered states, so it all seems to make sense. And um, what seems of, like presenting an opportunity for trickery um, actually may be a part of the whole process of the seance, of what, it, of what it's all about, and, and how, you know, how the seance conditions can give rise to paranormal phenomena. 
Another example would be the use of music. So again, there's the entertainment value, of course, but we also know that music and rhythms um, have an effect on us and they, they can induce a trance states in us. So all of these different factors are going on at the same time, and, and it leads to not only altered states of consciousness in the medium, but I would also suggest altered consciousness in the sitters as well. Did uh, you, uh, I don't know how many seances you, you sat through or participated in, but it, it must be a lot. Uh, maybe you could tell us how many, and then could you point to a few examples where you think something legitimately paranormal, or I, I know you don't take sides on whether it's real or not, but truly inexplicable uh, um, uh, happened, where where maybe communication with some kind of a consciousness that wasn't uh, human or present or alive uh, happened? Yeah, well, for me personally, the most um, impressive experience was when my own hand, my left hand, seemed to be <laughs> possessed. And this happened during um, a seance where the medium couldn't attend for some reason. So they, the circle leader decided that they were going to do uh, an open development sitting and basically invite spirits to let themselves be known to anyone who was in the room. So this involves basically going into a, a, like a quiet meditation ourselves and you know listening to the music in the red light and just kind of relaxing and seeing what happened. So I, I relaxed, I did my meditation, and then kind of at the, the peak of my meditation, I had a, almost like a, a mini out-of-body experience where I seemed to slide out the back of my body, um, not very far, but just enough. And I felt this tingling in my left hand, and it started to, from, from my perspective, um, it started to move of its own accord. Now, it was a really strange um, state of consciousness that I was in. It was some kind of a dissociative state because I was, although I was aware and able to feel my own body, at the same time, I was also aware of the fact that I wasn't consciously willing my hand to move. Um, and the whole thing obviously freaked me out. Um, and I, I snapped myself out of the experience and came back into the room and everyone was kind of like laughing at me because, you know, they, they expect these kinds of weird phenomena to happen and I wasn't necessarily expecting it. <laughs> uh, but as an anthropologist, then it was my duty to carry on and go back into the experience and feel it a bit more. Uh, and the whole thing came again came on again much quicker um, and it didn't really it didn't really expand to anything more than that but it was a useful experience for me because it gave me this insight into what mediumship um, feels like and it gave me the, the kind of the viewpoint that I can extend my own experience and imagine that you know if I allowed the rest of my body to be uh, controlled in that way then that would be a full you know a full possession so yeah I mean there was nothing particularly super impressive in the seances that I went to, but cumulatively, all of these small effects, my own experience of having my hand possessed, seeing the spirits talk through mediums, um, seeing flashes of light and um, this transfiguration phenomenon, all of these things taken together present an interesting case. Well, we're going to get into some specifics. I'd like to hear about some voices that you may have heard during these sessions uh, in a moment. We're talking with Dr. Jack Hunter about his book, Engaging the Anomalous, uh, packed with some really interesting uh, stories about experiences he's had and people that he's, he's met in these circles. We'll be right we're back talking with, with Dr. More. Jack Hunter about Engaging the Anomalous, his collected essays, looking at paranormal subjects from an anthropological point of view. In a moment, uh, we're going to ask him about examples where he heard actual voices uh, in these seances that were conducted in a, in a group that he worked with to uh, write his Ph.D. We'll be right back. So I just heard that announcement about uh, George Norrie being nominated for the Radio Hall of Fame, and um, yeah, I'm going to go vote for that. He deserves to be in that, and I uh, hope you guys will, uh, you folks who are listening tonight, will... Uh, We'll vote for him as well. We have information on the website if you need to figure out how to cast your, your votes for him. Vote early and vote often. We're talking with Dr. Jack Hunter about engaging the anomalous. Jack, there's a uh, section of your book where you uh, refer to a colleague, a fellow anthropologist named Edith Turner, who uh, had some has embraced sort of the, the same approach that, that you have uh, to these subjects, but she had some really dramatic encounters where she saw beings, right? Yeah, well, um, Edith Turner, she passed away um, a couple of years ago. I had the 
amazing privilege of being able to meet her in 2014 at the Esalen Institute in Big Sur. And um, she was incredible. She was the wife of Victor Turner, who in terms of, you know, anthropologists, Victor Turner is one of the most famous and influential anthropologists. And she was his wife, and she'd actually been with him while he was doing his own research. Um, and it was only kind of after he passed away that she started to to write her own uh, research papers and, and publish books and things. Uh, but there was one particular experience that she had um, with the Ndembu in Zambia, um, participating in something called the Ihamba ritual. And the Ihamba is um, a kind of a malignant spirit that can get into the body of, of, um, of human beings. So the whole purpose of the ceremony is to, it's basically like, a, like an exorcism, is to extract the spirit from the, from the afflicted patient. And Edith Turner had participated in it. Well, she'd observed this ritual before in the 19, I think in the 1950s or 1960s with Victor Turner. And they'd written about it at length and they'd, uh, you know, analyzed it and thought about all the different kinds of symbols that were being used and all those kinds of things. But it was only later after Victor Turner had died and she went back to Zambia that she participated in the ritual kind of like fully, um, and emotionally, and, you know, she really got involved in it. And at the climax of this ritual, which, you know, it, it goes on for a good few hours, and there's a lot of clapping and dancing and, and music and, you know, chanting, and the afflicted person, person is kind of in the, on the floor in the middle of a, a circle of people, and they're all, you know, doing their thing. And at the climax of the ritual, when they're supposed to be literally extracting the spirit from the, from the patient, she saw the medicine man or the witch doctor going over to the patient, putting his hands kind of over her back and pulling out this kind of gray, well, this is what Edith Turner described as a gray kind of ectoplasmic blob, um, a kind of like, a, you know, like a plasma. And um, the medicine man keeps hold of the plasma, keeps tight hold of it, and he puts it into a jar and then covers it over with a, a castor leaf. And then when they go to look in to see the spirit at the end, what they find inside is a human tooth. And the idea is that this human tooth is the kind of the physical um, embodiment of the spirit. And actually, their understanding is that as the you know as the person is as, is possessed by the spirit, that this human tooth is literally moving around inside their body, and that's kind of what's causing the the issues. So it was a really amazing experience for Edith Turner that she she saw this ectoplasmic blob being extracted from the back of the patient and then she had the courage then to go and write about that and publish it in um in some mainstream anthropology journals and really what she did um, with that paper was to encourage other anthropologists in her own words to learn to see what the natives see so her idea is that if we really want to understand things like ritual and spirit possession or um spirit mediumship and things like that, or shamanism or, you know, whatever, that we have to learn to be able to experience it. Um, we have to kind of let down our, our um, I guess, the, the term that I use is our kind of ontological flood barriers. We have to let down our flood barriers and allow ourselves to, you know, participate in and experience these things firsthand, because that's the only way that we're really going to understand what's going on in these ritual contexts. I mean, we well, it was very the, brave of her to brave of her to write it and amazing that a journal published it i know yeah really amazing and then she wrote a book about it as well called experiencing ritual um and yeah she's gone on to inspire lots of different anthropologists including myself uh yeah really inspirational lady and i was so so pleased to be able to to meet her i actually have a short um article coming out at some point in the next couple of months reflecting on my experience with edith turner which is going to be published in the Journal for the Study of Religious Experience. So that'll be out soon. You also had an experience with ectoplasm. I don't remember where it is in your book, but I, I think you said you saw it form at some in one of your seances or uh, one of the medium uh, encounters. Yeah, it was um, during a seance with um, a, a visiting medium. So he's um, a physical medium, um, and he's kind of he's quite controversial, really. I wouldn't say his name now, but he, he's quite a controversial medium. Some pe lots of people say that they've um, caught him, um, you know, doing fraud. And perhaps we'll touch on that later. I think there's a connection between mediumship and fraud and performance. But he um, he, he came to do a guest seance uh, demonstration, and um, he said that he would 
be able to produce ectoplasm. So I was very excited because I, I, you know, you want to see ectoplasm, don't you? It's the kind of thing that <laughs> you hear talk about, and it would be great to see. But unfortunately, it was quite a disappointing experience. And was um, that one of the spirit voices said, "Do you want to see ectoplasm?" And of course, everyone in the in the room, in the seance room said, "Yeah, we'd love to see ectoplasm." He said, "Okay, turn off the lights then and put on the music." And automatically, everyone's like, oh, "Okay, the lights have got to go off." So that's a bit suspicious. But anyway, so we turned off the lights, we put the music on, and we were waiting and waiting. And then the spirit voice said, "Okay, you can turn the lights back on again now." And we turned on <laughs> the lights, and all we saw was a thin strip of what looked like silk or something um, coming out from the seance cabinet, which is like a curtained off corner of the room and attached to the top of um, a spirit trumpet, which is like an, an aluminium trumpet that in, in seances is supposed to be levitated and fly around the room. So it was a really unimpressive display of ectoplasm. And then the spirit voice said, okay, would you like to see the ectoplasm moving? So obviously everyone was like, yeah, we'd love to see it moving. So said, okay, switch off the lights and turn on the music. So we did that again. We waited in the darkness for a few moments, and then the spirit said, okay, turn on the lights. And they turned on the lights, and all that was happening was this thin piece of silk was kind of um, waggling about, uh, you know, as though someone inside the cabinet was moving it deliberately. So unfortunately, it wasn't a very impressive display of ectoplasm. Um, but that doesn't mean to say that other mediums aren't able to produce you know, genuine ectoplasm. I mean, have you come across the Felix Experimental Group uh, at all? No. They're one of the biggest, um, at the moment, they're kind of most widely known of the, the new age of physical mediumship. Um, so they're a, a, a seance group based in Germany, and they seem to be producing some seriously extraordinary phenomena, all sorts of different kinds of things like apports, which are objects that appear in, or they disappear from one location and appear in the seance room. Um, this medium seems to be able to produce um, crystals that come out of his eyes, you know, kind of like an Indian swami or something. Um, and then he also seems to be able to produce these full-bodied ectoplasmic materializations, uh, which is pretty, you know, far-out crazy stuff. Um, but there are lots of people who go to these seances, have these experiences, and come away, you know, convinced that what they've seen is genuine. So I haven't personally had the opportunity to see the Felix group yet, um, but well, I would like to. Let me ask you this. Of the seances that you sat through, I mean, I don't know if you have just people coming in randomly. They uh, engage a medium to connect with a departed loved one, a dead loved one, and then they hear voices. Have you seen any of those uh, kinds of situations where a voice comes through and it really does seem to be legitimately communication with the dead? Yeah, well, this is the interesting thing about the um, the group that I worked with, the Bristol Spirit Lodge. I mean, their main purpose is developing physical mediumship and trance mediumship. So it's not like in the spiritualist churches where you go to specifically make contact with a deceased loved one. Um, usually the mediums at the lodge had their own spirit teams and they were kind of regular communicators. But occasionally some other spirit would drop in. But there was one particular seance, and this is this is what makes this so intriguing, it was a seance with this same medium who had produced the, the not very impressive ectoplasm. And during the seance, um, a spirit made itself known to one of the sitters. It, 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 I don't know whether it was a materialized spirit or whether it was the medium going over to talk to her, but whatever happened, she heard the voice and she instantly broke down in tears because she recognized the voice as belonging to, I can't remember who it was, her, her, her father, I think. And she recognized the voice, and she was convinced that it was, you know, a genuine communication. So it's really interesting that we seem to have this, this, you know, what seems like um, a bit of a paradox going on with mediums who seem to be faking phenomena, but also at the same time seem to be producing, you know, genuine or evidential uh, information for, for people. It's really, you know, a confusing, perplexing kind of area of study. Well, fraud is a part of it, and there have been frauds. And and once you have one fraud and it gets a lot of publicity, it sort of um, infects the the whole uh, genre. Yeah, I, you know that's it's been a part of the mediumship forever, I guess, and yeah. and and undoubtedly still is. But I I know that you know some people are 
really helped, whether it's fraud or not, they really are helped by it. They are relieved and, and relieved of guilt and stress and because they think that the communication with a dead loved one is legit. Yeah, exactly. So there, there are these clear, like, psychotherapeutic benefits of mediumship, um, which is, you know, one other reason to take it seriously. Um, but I also think there's a that this kind of fraud and performance aspect is kind of fundamental to mediumship in some way as well. And um, I've talked a little bit in the past about um, a parapsychologist called Kenneth Batcheldor, who was doing experiments in the 1970s and 1980s on um, traditional kind of table tipping uh, seances. And he found that if he introduced a fake phenomenon early on in the seance, that later on it was more likely that there would be genuine effects. So his suggestion was that by introducing fake phenomena, it sort of affects people's instant belief, if that makes sense. So it makes people think that it's possible for you know, these, these outlandish paranormal things to happen. And as soon as people start to believe that it's possible, then it's more likely that the effects will actually manifest in the seance room. So I think, you know, if we look at, at shamanism and all of these different magic or religious practices, we see these elements of trickery and fraud in there. And our gut reaction is to kind of, you know, to cast them away and to ignore them as, as complete fraud and, you know, as, 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 as fake, basically. And my suggestion is that we need to kind of reevaluate that position and think about the possibility that performance and fraud and trickery and, you know, like, sleight of hand and all those kinds of things might also be a part of the process of kind of affecting consciousness in some way, of, um, of putting us into a receptive frame of mind where um, genuine things can start to happen. Well, I, I would equate it to sort of crop circle makers. You know, a lot of crop circles and crop formations are made by humans using boards, but they're sort of driven to do it. They don't exactly know yeah. why they do it sometimes. And, um, yeah, and also people report strange experiences you know, at crop circle sites, even if they are man-made sites, they still report, you know, seeing flying orbs of light or encounters with um, spirits or aliens. Well, it kind of makes me think of tulpas, where, you know, they're thought beings that, that we will into existence, like Slender Man, maybe. Yeah, I think that that's touching on something fundamental here as well, is that when we think about seances, it's not just the medium who's responsible for the phenomena that are manifest. But actually, it's a, a group, um, a group process, and you know, by everyone entering into altered states of consciousness and interacting with each other in altered states, and then having their levels of belief affected, and all of those kinds of things, it's a cumulative effect. And sometimes, you know, sometimes the cumulative effect works, and you have a really good seance, and sometimes it doesn't work. But it definitely seems to be that seance phenomena, at least, are kind of a group. Um, or a collective phenomenon with lots of influences from the sitters as well as the medium. Uh, the idea of consciousness, I mean, is, is central to what you're talking about. We don't really know what consciousness is. We don't know where it comes from. Uh, if consciousness is uh, the result of brain function, then, you know, presumably when the brain dies, um, consciousness should go away. Of course, you know, much of the world believes that uh, that once the human body dies, that the consciousness goes to heaven or hell or nirvana or something else like that. Um, wh where are you on consciousness, the source of consciousness, and whether or not it's a brain function? Yeah. Well, again, I'm open to multiple possibilities. It's clear that the brain is involved in some way, but I think I tend to to fall more towards the kind of the, the filter um, hypothesis of consciousness. The idea that consciousness is something that isn't generated by the brain, but that is modulated by the brain. Uh, so we can have changes in brain functioning affecting our experience. You know, as we see, like if, if you consume a psychoactive substance, it's the chemicals in the substance that alter your brain and, you know, lead to an altered state of consciousness. But the question is, is it causing the altered state of consciousness or is it allowing another aspect of consciousness to emerge? So that's kind of more where I lie, and I see that, that transmediumship and all of these different kinds of practices are ways of uh, kind of like retuning the brain in a way. Um, but this, is, this is why we need sensory deprivation and music and all of these different kinds of things to retune our brain, not to produce the experience, but to create the right kind of conditions that are needed for 
um, that altered state to emerge. So, Some yeah. pretty dramatic uh, uh, research, scientific research and studies about uh, mushrooms and the, yeah. the long-term effects they have on mental health and emotional well-being. Yeah. There was a, an interesting study a couple of years ago um, that showed that at the peak of psychedelic magic mushroom trip, um, the activity in the brain or the blood flow in the brain is actually reduced. So the usual uh, explanation used to be that when you take a psychoactive substance, it leads to like, you know, hyperactivity in the brain. And that's why you have expanded um, experiences, where you have rich and vivid experiences. But actually what it seems to be now is that when you take the psychoactive substance, the activity in the brain is, is reduced. So if brain activity is reduced, but conscious experience is enhanced, then it suggests that the brain is more like a, a you know, like I was saying, like a reducing valve or a filter for consciousness. And they've interested, interestingly found similar effects um, in psychographers who are automatic writing mediums. And they found in um, brain uh, imaging studies with, with these psychographers that when they're in their trance state and they're doing this kind of complex writing, that those areas of the brain that are usually associated with those kinds of activities um, are kind of are less active. So again, it seems to be like in order to allow uh, these other aspects of consciousness or these spirits or however we want to think about them to, to manifest, we have to put our brain into a specific state. And that seems to be a kind of a more restful, um, less active state. Yeah, you mentioned uh, elsewhere in the book, and I never knew what to make of channelers. I, I didn't put a lot of stock into them, but there's a study by Hughes and Melville that you cite in the book about they uh, yeah. hooked them up to an EEG and found that there were statistically significant increases in beta, alpha, and theta brainwave activity, I guess, when channelers. Yeah. So this is another interesting aspect of it. When we're thinking about channeling and mediumship and spirit possession, these states seem to be distinctive states. So uh, I'll tell you what, Jack, I, I, I shouldn't have asked you that because we need to go into a break, but I'll let you continue on that line, and then we'll open up the phone lines as well. Joe Cocker, Cocker takes us into the break. We'll be right back. We're talking with uh, Dr. Jack Hunter about engaging the anomalous, uh, seances, communicating with the dead, other kinds of psi phenomena. In a moment, we open up the phone lines uh, after I uh, get him to respond to a couple more questions. We'll be right back. Uh, Jack Hunter, one of the people who wrote a, a glowing review about your book was Dean Radin, Dr. Dean Radin, who's done some amazing work uh, measuring uh, effects, significant, small but significant effects uh, of psi, uh, effects of, you know, psychic phenomena. Um, the folks at uh, Stanford Research, Hal Putoff and others, uh, did work on remote viewing and, and measuring uh, psychic abilities of people like Uri Geller, and they, they found it to be significant and documentable. Uh, we Before the break, we mentioned about these uh, folks who were studying channelers. There were measurable differences in the brains of the people who were said they were channeling. Yeah. Yeah, they, um, they seem to go into distinctive psychophysiological states. So what's most interesting about this is when, um, if we look back at all the kind of theories of, of um, channeling and possession and mediumship, one of the most kind of popular theories is they're suffering from some kind of um, dissociative identity disorder or what used to be called multiple personality disorder. Um, you know, so they go into these kind of dissociative states and then they have different, different personalities talking through them. So on the surface, it seems very similar to, to a kind of a pathological condition. But what these um, EEG studies revealed was that the kind of brain activity that's taking place in someone who's suffering from um, dissociative identity disorder or someone who's suffering from schizophrenia is very different to the kind of brain activity that's occurring in someone who's you know, practicing mediumship or channeling. So what it seems to suggest is that you know, when a medium is or when a channeler is going into their altered state, then that, that their, their brain is actually changing, that they are actually doing something. I mean, it's not to say that it's necessarily, you know, genuinely spirits coming through, although, you know, we have to be open to that possibility. Um, but it, it's demonstrating that there is something different and something interesting that's taking place. So, you know, if we take that as a, as a, a fresh starting point, then it it opens up the whole discussion again, and we can start to re-engage with um, mediumship and channeling 
from a different Yeah, if there's something physically measurable, then you can say, look, something is happening here. We don't exactly know what it was, but at least it's a starting point for doing more research as opposed to exposing it as a fraud or deciding it's a fraud before you start. Exactly. Um, I want to mention, ask one other question uh, before we go to the phones. It's about the trickster. And you mentioned uh, the trickster phenomena a couple of times in the book. Uh, yeah. it, it appeals to me because of some experience that I have had, uh, not experience, but a story that I've worked on for a number of years at, at a place called Skinwalker Ranch, where mm. uh, Native Americans had ascribed uh, a whole range of really weird activity to a shapeshifter, a uh, skinwalker. And I wondered if... Um, you know, the, the activity is non-repeatable. It never happens the same way once. And there is a level of ridiculousness to it, uh, that, that it is almost created. Some of the activities and events are created to be so ridiculous that no one would ever believe them. And then it never happens again. Is that uh, sort of uh, in your realm uh, of something that you have studied as an anthropologist? Yeah, it definitely is. I mean, the, the concept, the idea of the trickster, um, it, it is an anthropological idea it comes from anthropology well i mean it comes from you know native american traditions and all around the world but anthropologists have used it as a kind of um as a conceptual tool and really it 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 was pushed to the kind of the paranormal in the context of george hansen's work and he wrote that a a lovely foreword for this book as well which is i'm very grateful for but yeah i think there is this trickster element especially in um, physical mediumship it kind of um, ties in with what we were talking about earlier about the the role of fraud and trickery in all of this. Um, there needs to be some kind, some level of um, of uncertainty, I think, um, and and that's that's what this this issue of trickery and performance in mediumship does. Is you, you can never fully tell if they're kind of putting it on or not. Um, you can never tell whether they are tricking you or deceiving you or whether it's a genuine phenomenon. There's just no simple way of, of ruling out fraud. But like I was saying earlier, I think that that's a fundamental element of the paranormal. And I think that's what you're touching on with the Skinwalker Ranch is that you know, there is something about the paranormal that is deliberately messing with us. Um, <laughs> is that what you were trying to get at? Yes, exactly. Uh, I'm sorry, I have one more question before I yeah. lose you to the callers here. Have you ever used a medium to try to communicate with uh, a dead loved one, someone from your family or a friend who's passed on? Um, I haven't personally, although I, well, that said, I, I did have a message from a, um, a spiritualist church um, that seemed to be about someone in my family, um, someone who passed away. Um, it was some, they said that they, they picked up a George hanging around with me, funnily enough. Hmm. And, um, you know, I, I didn't know of any uh, Georges in my family who'd passed away until I, I went home and, and mentioned this to my mum and she said, oh, that'll be um, Dad's dad, George. So, you know, maybe I have had a meeting. I didn't, I, a, a reading. I didn't go out seeking it for myself um, because, you know, none of, my, none of my really close family have actually passed away. Um, but I did get this unsolicited message from someone who was potentially, you know, in my ancestor. Well, that's an interesting part of it is, uh, you know, I've, I've uh, talked to people who've had these experiences and used mediums and they go into these uh, these encounters uh, with uh, someone in mind that they want to contact and somebody else entirely comes through or, or something else yeah. happens altogether. Uh, yeah. We're going to go to the phones on the wild card line. Lori in Sacramento has a question, I think, that's on the minds of a lot of people. Hey, Lori. Good afternoon. Amy. How are you? OK, how's it going? Hi, I um, always had a question for Mr. Hunter, Hunter about um, the seances, if you can be possessed or followed by an entity that may come out during your seance. Mm. Well, it's certainly a possibility. I wouldn't want to rule it out, but yeah, I mean, one thing that they do in the seance is they do have precautions against that kind of thing. So they, you always start the seances off with, um, with a prayer, they, they call it a non-denominational prayer, so it's not specifically to God, but it's to a, a higher intelligence, which could include God. And they always ask for a canopy of protection over the seance room during the seances. So they're constantly trying to rule out the possibility of inviting in you know, negative entities that could you know, follow you around afterwards. Um, Thank you, Laurie. That... Appreciate that. Have you ever seen someone who's had a really bad, uh, sort of a bad trip? Um... You know, they come out of these and they, they've got problems? Um, no, 
not during a seance, no. All of the seances that I've been to have been pretty positive, and no one's ever had an, a negative experience. Although um, it is interesting that a lot of the mediums that I worked with had had negative experiences early on in their kind of mediumship development, and it was only through developing mediumship, you know, in a an organized ritual setting that they were able to overcome those negative aspects of their ability. So yeah. it, it, it seems like they didn't understand it to begin with, and then it's through learning about mediumship that they learned to understand and control their ability. You uh, talked in the, in the book, or you wrote in the book, about uh, the need for training mediums, that there aren't enough of them to go around. And you had some training yourself and then uh, had an experience or two. Um, it's not, is it an innate ability, or is it something that everybody can do? Um, they, I think a lot of spiritualists would argue that it's something that everybody could do, um, that it just requires kind of training and dedication to, to, to develop it. Um, but then there are also people who seem to be, for whatever reason, whether they have some kind of a special configuration in their, their biology or whatever, some people seem to be kind of naturally gifted. So there's a, there's a broad spectrum, I think. Everyone potentially has the possibility to do these things or the capability to do these things. But at the same time, there are kind of those, um, uh, what's the word? like um, Naturally gifted or, gifted. you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like remote viewing, like the like we hear about remote viewers. Yeah, some some people are expert remote viewers just naturally, and other people have to learn to develop it. Uh, east of the Rockies, John in North Carolina. Good morning, John. Yes. Hi, John. Good morning. Hey, how are you? All right. What's on your mind? Yep. Um, I just wanted to say, you know, um, I heard a few um, trigger points like music. Like, and I, I'm speaking to your guest. Um, I heard music. I um, also heard something earlier about a green face. Yeah. And that is really odd because I actually had an experience with that, like okay. seeing someone with a green face, which is right. completely paranormal. Um, and, you know, a couple of the comments, and then I'm going to hang up, and let him comment, but uh, I did, I was able to connect with the spirit at my house and actually record a female voice, uh, which is kind of sci-fi, crazy, I know, sounds, and it's really odd, and, you know, and I've tried to keep doing it, but I can't get her again. And then I did, I actually, um, I'm a musician. I, um, I had a healing when I was eight years old. And this guy, like, literally, like, it was supernatural, and he healed my head. Um, it was just an abrasion on my forehead from a bike. I'll tell you what, John, that's a lot to chew on there. Why don't we uh, uh, let uh, Jack uh, respond to a little bit of that. Thank you for your call. Yeah, one of the things that, that comes out of that for me was the, the mention of the green face that he saw. I mean, it just goes to show that, you know, the, you have these experiences that you think are unique to you, um, that like, you know, a green face appearing over, over the medium's face and then slowly disappearing. It sounds like something that's really kind of out there and, you know, no one else is going to have had that kind of experience. But then when you start to talk to people, um, there seem to be these common threads that emerge which kind of further lends a little bit of, you know, extra credence to these phenomena. Uh, the fact that, you know, someone in the U.S. can have a similar experience to the experience that I had in suburban Bristol, you know, it lends credence to it. So it's very interesting. Uh, the idea that, uh, you know, you can contact a spirit at some point in your life and then you can't do it again, uh, you, you address that in the book and that even trained mediums um, can make a connection and then are, are unable to do it again. Yeah, I, I, again, I think that ties in with what we were talking about with the trickster. It's, it, and it also goes to show that it's not something that we control. You know, it's something that we interact with, but it seems to, be, it seems to have its own mind. Um, it seems to have its own kind of intentions. So, yeah, I think that, that's also really interesting. We can never, we'll go to, we can never pinpoint I'm sorry. exactly. Uh, west of the Rockies, Robert in Tucson. Hey, Robert. Hello. Um, I'd like to know your thoughts about 
Houdini and his exposure of fraudulent mediums. Please comment specifically about the case of Marjorie in Boston and the book that came out in 2015 called The Witch of Lime Street. Marjorie herself seems to have implied to another psychic that she faked her effects. Mm. Yeah, well, the Marjorie mediumship is one of the kind, for me, is one of the kind of the big defining points in the history of physical mediumship. And I think it was the point where mediumship really entered into its declining stages, where physical mediumship entered into its decline. Because the, the ex- Houdini's exposure of the Marjorie mediumship was, you know, so so public that it's had this a really lasting impact. I mean, I don't I don't doubt that she probably did produce, um, you know, fraudulent phenomena, um, and we know that she was caught red-handed a few times doing that kind of stuff. But at the same time, you know, there are other people who who report having um, really meaningful and important seances. Uh, it's not as clear cut as to say just because the Marjorie mediumship case was, you know, conclusively proven to be fraudulent that therefore mediumship um, isn't effective. Um, it's just another aspect of this confusing tapestry of mediumship. I'll try to get one more call in. Uh... Uh, William in Los Angeles on the wildcard line. Hey, William. How you doing, Mr. Knapp? Good morning. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, good morning. Yeah. What's on your mind? Um, I, I have a question for, for your guest. Uh, when he talks about voices, um, I, I assume he's talking about disembodied spirits generating what seems to be a voice. And I've always wondered when people say that, how do they explain how that happens since there's no body and no voice box? Is is this just a euphemism for something that we don't understand, or h- how would you scientifically explain what you're hearing in terms of physiology? No, that's a good yeah, question. Jack, are they uh, are they disembodied voices or voices coming through the mediums? Again, we're, we're talking about um, there's, there's several different ways that we can understand this. The, most of the time, the mediums that I was dealing with, the voices were coming from the voice box of the medium. Um, so they were going into a trance and then the spirit was basically possessing their body and then talking through their body. But I've also been in seances where the voices are ostensibly um, external voices. And we can in- interpret them in two different ways, really. One, we could think of them in terms of a, of a real physical voice that's out there that's you know using sound to transmit information. And um, from a, kind of, a kind of spiritualist perspective, um, if you read the literature... They often talk about the use of ectoplasm to form um, a physical voice box. I mean, it sounds far out and crazy, but this is what these people um, have have suggested. So in some cases, these external voices may be produced by an external ectoplasmic voice box. Um, And then there's also the the aspect of consciousness again that comes into this. And perhaps the the voices, external voices, could be some kind of um, auditory hallucinations. Again, not to suggest that because they're hallucinations that they're not genuine voices or that they don't have something meaningful to say, just that there are lots of different ways that voices could make themselves known to us. You know, they could make themselves known to us physically or they could make themselves known to us kind of like um, psychically or telepathically as well. So, yeah, there's there's a few different options there. Um, any advice to people who might be looking for a medium? They're, they They want to give it a try. They want to try to communicate with someone who's gone... I think you mentioned at the beginning that there's some kind of board in the UK that that regulates mediums. As far as I know, we don't have that here. But uh, uh, what what cautions would you give? What advice would you give? Yeah, um, I would first of all say don't don't rush into it. Think about it and talk to people about it beforehand because we know that you can get involved in disreputable practices quite easily when it, when we start to talk about mediumship. Um, there are people out there who, who are just out to make money. And, uh, in, interesting, that's one of the interesting things about the Bristol Spirit Lodge is that there's no money involved at all, and they're not going out to try and, you know, to convince people of anything. They're, they're basically a private group doing it for themselves. Um, so, yeah, do your research. Find mediums who have had, you know, a good you know, feedback and comments. Um, and yeah, don't rush into it. Um. There's one one last call we'll try to get in real quick. Mike in Houston. Hey, Mike. Everybody yeah, you there. know what? I think I, he, 
Hello. Hey, Mike, we got about a minute here, so you better make it quick. Okay, I was just going to bring up uh, Arthur Conan Doyle and his impact on uh, spiritualism. Um, what were your thoughts on that? And uh, the uh, well, let's just leave it at that. Since we're all right, thank, thanks, Mike. Sorry, I cut you off there. Appreciate it. No, Arthur Conan Doyle. I mean, we could probably talk for another hour about Arthur Conan Doyle. Um, but yeah, I think he's interesting, and I found his book, The History of Spiritualism. He did the two-volume book, The History of Spiritualism. Um, really useful when I was beginning my research. But, you know, if you're interested in spiritualism, Arthur Conan Doyle is your starting place. He's not the kind of like the end point. So, yeah, read Arthur Conan Doyle's works on spiritualism, but then explore out from there as well. Uh, Jack Hunter, thanks very much. The book is called Engaging the Anomalous. It's so well written and easy to read and just a, a fun experience. Thanks for being here. That's great. Thanks so much for having me. All right. Uh, thanks also to my first guest, uh, Kevin Day. And to my colleagues at Coast to Coast, Nathan Staten, Donna Walker, our webmaster, Lex Lonehood, Dan Galani, and producer, Chris Boros. I'm George Knapp. Good night. I'll be back next Sunday.